With Sulla dead, and Marians from across the Mediterranean streaming back to Rome at the invitation of Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, Julius Caesar left Bithynia and returned home. And though his campaigns under Thermus, along with his time spent at the court of Bithynia, had helped to improve Caesar's financial situation, he still needed to earn much more. Running for public office was an expensive undertaking. It would be some years before Caesar met the age requirement for even the lowest public office, but that time needed to be spent building up the necessary fortune for public life. So, like most men who were too young for public office, Caesar became a court advocate. Caesar's most notable court case of the 77 BC year was his prosecution of the ex-consul, Nius Cornelius Dolabella. Dolabella had been one of Sulla's loyal lieutenants. He had served with Sulla at the Battle of Sacroportus, which saw Marius the Younger abandoned by his fleeing soldiers. Dolabella also fought at the Battle of the Colline Gate, for which he was awarded, by Sulla, the 81 BC consulship. Unfortunately for Dolabella, the 81 BC consulship was merely a decoration considering Sulla's dictatorship gave him all the power in Rome. Following his consulship, Dolabella was made proconsul of Macedonia, which was one of Rome's more sought-after proconsular postings due to the massive wealth governors could acquire. And though Dolabella was granted a triumph for victories he achieved while governing Thrace, he was accused of extortion by the Macedonian people. Caesar took the case and prosecuted Dolabella in the extortion court, but Dolabella's great wealth allowed him to purchase the services of Rome's top orator, Quintus Hortensius. As secondary counsel for his defense, Dolabella also hired Gaius Aurelius Cotta, who was the uncle of Caesar. Against Hortensius and Cotta, Caesar was unable to secure a conviction. Dolabella was acquitted of all charges. But his trial demonstrated to the people what excellent rhetoric and oratorical skills Caesar possessed, as well as a code of ethics which showed Caesar was not above prosecuting his own class on behalf of common people. He, like Cicero, had trained under Apollonius Molin when, in the mid-80s BC, the Greek rhetorician from Rhodes had visited Rome. Even Cicero commented regarding Caesar's talent, come now, what orator would you rank above him? Caesar's prosecution also brought him to the attention of Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, who was busy trying to recreate his own version of the Marian party. Lepidus viewed Caesar in the same light Carbo had seen Marius the Younger. To Lepidus, this nephew of Gaius Marius was the person around whom the Marians could, and should rally. He was the perfect candidate. Caesar's wealth, along with the security of his wife's dowry, had been confiscated by Sulla. And now, he prosecuted a former Sullen in the extortion court, proving that, though Caesar was a patrician, he was unwilling to protect those who abused their positions of power, even from among his own class of people. The fact that he had won a military crown during the very first battle of his career didn't go amiss either. Caesar's success at Mytilene paid a type of symbolic homage to the military brilliance passed on to him by his late uncle. Left destitute by Marius's enemies, Caesar seemed unlikely to support Sulla's friends, who represented Rome's new conservative elite. Caesar was perfect. He was everything Lepidus needed to win over the support of the Roman people. To his surprise, however, Caesar was not keen to be a part of Lepidus's cause. Violence had broken out in the Italian countryside. The settlement at Faciale, or modern-day Fiesole, which was in the province of Etruria, was completely overrun by the locals. Rioting broke out there, and people unexpectedly stormed into the strongholds, murdering a large portion of the inhabitants, and taking back the Etrurian land for themselves. After this bloody massacre was complete, the inhabitants of Etruria sent a deputation to the Senate to defend their actions. They boldly claimed to Rome's August fathers that they took back, in kind, only what Sulla had stolen from him when he chose Etruria on which to settle his retired veterans. Before long, rumors circulated that Campania would follow the same example. Even in Rome, frightened homeowners, who had purchased proscription properties, doubled down on security against the anticipation of violence from previous owners. And though none could prove it, it was commonly suspected that Lepidus, himself, was behind all this dissension. 
Both Etruria and Campania had been mentioned by name as part of the promises Lepidus had made to reverse Sullen policies. And though Lepidus had taken a vow with his co-consul, Catulus, to not let their differences escalate as far as war, Lepidus made little effort to check, or condemn, the actions of the rampaging Etrurians. Unlike Pompeius Magnus, who had ignored Sulla's verbal caution to avoid getting mixed up with Lepidus, Caesar's own instincts led him to the same conclusion. Lepidus seemed shady, so, having no confidence in Lepidus's history, nor his ability to lead, Caesar politely declined the offer of an alliance, and returned to his court advocacy.